Hi there, this is Heather with Autism Chrysalis again. In part one, I talked about how wanting an ergonomic mouse turned into this whole big project in my mind. I talked about how it wasn't overthinking, but was problem solving, and what the differences are. In the end, I only ended up buying the mouse, and I made my own trackpad out of an old book, and was reasonably satisfied with that. But a few weeks later, it turned into a much bigger project, taking a direction that I wasn't expecting, and that's what I want to talk about today. Because many people would consider what I did next as overreacting, or dramatizing, or blowing it out of proportion, or making a big deal out of nothing. And it's true that I went down a rabbit hole of research and spent a lot of money that I wasn't planning on, but I think there's some important differences between what actually happened and overreacting, or making a mountain out of a molehill. After experiencing some pain relief from the ergonomic mouse, I started paying attention to how much I avoid using my keyboard, and have been avoiding it for years. I use dictation extensively, but that needs a lot of small corrections with the keyboard, and I frequently write short notes with the keyboard. I started thinking about getting an ergonomic keyboard, but I've tried them in the past and didn't actually find them that comfortable. I'm a small person, and they tend to be made for people with a larger arm reach, I knew, of course, that there are a lot of other keyboards available, and monitors, and other peripherals, but in my head, those weren't available options to me because I have a laptop. I've had this one for about 10 years, and it still works just fine, but in all of those years, I've complained about arm and wrist pain and eye strain. I've changed the light and color settings on the screen to make them the most eye-friendly possible. I have a night shift program called Flux that reduces blue light in the evening. I regularly do eye exercises to keep my muscles focusing at a wide range of focal lengths. I even got a prescription for computer glasses for a while. I've done so much to relieve eye strain, but I resisted getting a separate monitor because I really like the portability of my laptop. I frequently move to different spots around my office and around my house to work for an hour or two here, a few hours there, because my body needs to move frequently between various reclining or semi-laying down positions which is difficult to do with an external keyboard and monitor in tow. Then something shifted in my mind that made new ideas possible. It occurred to me that I've been spending the last eight years finding all the ways that I've accepted societal programming as if they were my own beliefs, and have been deprogramming those and choosing which ones I agree with and which ones I'll accept for the time being for practical reasons, but I'm consciously disagreeing with, and which ones I can cast off and get completely free of, and never look back. And here I have this computer that came with a screen, and a keyboard, and a trackpad, and I thought myself lucky that they were all included in a neatly contained and portable package. But it didn't occur to me that part of what I was doing was accepting the standard option given to me without question. I was taking someone else's choices as my own, and feeling stuck with options that have been causing me physical pain for more than a decade. And knowing that there were other options, but summarily rejecting all of them because I had previously made the one choice to have a laptop. To put it another way, for the sake of meeting one of my needs, portability, I had allowed a team of people, all strangers to me, who have far different goals than my individual comfort or usability, Things like manufacturing costs and constraints, marketability, design, fit for average sizes for people, and all sorts of things that may or may not help me, in particular, to use the single piece of equipment that I spend the most time with every day of my life. When that clicked in my head, suddenly all those external computer peripherals moved in my mind from the category of things that I might find in a store to things that I could buy, and then to things that I could use with my laptop, which was the biggest shift. Instead of coming up with lots of reasons why those per peripherals wouldn't work, or rejecting them out of hand, I started looking for ways that they could work for me. My all-or-nothing thinking gave way to thinking that I could have a computer set up that I didn't have to use all of the time. It could be an option for some of the time. What I mostly have been trying to problem-solve for the last several months 
is how I'm going to get an extensive amount of content on autistic burnout recovery out of my head and into the format that I'm wanting to create for my course on autistic burnout recovery. I have a lot of dedicated, a lot of dictated notes and articles that need extensive editing. And I have a bunch of half written notes that need to be finished, but got too painful to do at the time. I have a ton more information in my head that I can spout out when one of my clients asks me about it, but it just hurts too much to sit down and write. And even dictating leaves me with the problems of still needing to correct and edit. I've traded editing work for coaching with a few people, but they can't get the content out of my head for me, or tie it together in the way that I'm envisioning. And after all that, I still need to put it all together into a usable format, and that will take another round of extensive computer time. And for a while, I've been stymied on figuring out how this will be possible, because my current computer usage already hurts a lot, and this would take a lot more, and yet I want to make this course so badly, and it's so needed and so wanted. But once I had that thought that my computer doesn't have to be all or nothing, a whole world of possibilities opened up. I could set up a separate desk station that had peripherals that I could plug into when I wanted to use that, and unplug to use the computer for my coaching or if I wanted to lie on the ground to work for a while, or on the bed, or a lounge chair, or all the other places that I frequently move between. One thing that I already knows, know works well for me is to write for a couple of hours first thing in the morning. I can get a ton of content done easily and then go about my day doing all the other things. So if I started the day at that separate workstation, I could get a lot of this course done, potentially with a lot less pain. So I started looking more earnestly at external computer monitors and keyboards. I'll save you the saga of that particular rabbit hole, but suffice it to say that I spent two weeks learning more than I realized was possible about the many options for customizing keyboards and monitors. I decided in the end on an e-paper monitor and a split layout keyboard that has keys placed in a column layout so that the keys are stacked vertically on top of each other instead of shifted, which was a holdover from typewriters. The monitor arrived first. I found one used on eBay that is in absolutely new condition. I suspect someone bought it and then didn't like some of the dis disadvantages of the e-paper monitors and resold it pretty quickly. Apparently that's quite common with these types of monitors. And I'll admit, looking at it isn't pretty, it needs to be refreshed manually because it leaves residue of what was on the screen as it changes, which is called ghosting. Refreshing wipes all of that so that you start with a clean, a clean screen again, but that takes extra work because it has to be done manually. And there's no color. Everything on it moves a little bit slower, like the cursor moves a little slower. Videos aren't great to watch, but for reading and writing text, it's good enough. And within minutes of plugging it in, I could feel my eyes relaxing and moving already from my laptop screen up to the e-paper monitor, even before I had figured out all of the settings that I needed to adjust to get it to look the best it could. I've been using it for a couple of weeks now, and I absolutely love it. There are some drawbacks, as I mentioned, which is why the technology isn't popular, so there's not a large marketing incentive to develop the technology but there are a couple of companies working on it. Books and Dasong seem to be the leaders, and Dasong is developing a color monitor, which will be coming out soon. I got the Books one. Um, it's called the Mira Pro, if you're interested. I set it up on a folding table as my new temporary desk, and I'm finding that I'm plugging in my laptop a lot more than I expected that I would, because my eyes feel so much better looking at that screen even for video when the color and quality aren't that important, like for webinars. And because I'm not in so much pain, I have more energy throughout the day and more left over at the end of the day for other things. It's not an extraordinary amount, but it's noticeable. And I suspect that with time, it will grow. And this really is the point of unmasking, which is really what I'm doing here. Because one way to think of unmasking is questioning the standard options that were presented to you by society or your family or your school or workplace or wherever and deciding what aspects of that are actually good for you and which aren't and then making an active choice about your own path. 
not every standard option is going to be bad and needs to be rejected. That's just another form of all-or-nothing thinking. Some of the standard options got that way because they're genuinely useful. And some of them got that way because they met a need for some people, or at some time, and simply haven't been reconsidered. Like our standard QWERTY keyboards. They make sense on manual typewriters, because they needed to keep the most commonly used letters away from each other, and to slow the typist down, so that the little hammers that struck the letters onto the paper wouldn't run into each other as much. Since there are no manual hammers on electro electronic keyboards, that need is no longer relevant. But the first keyboards copied the typewriter layout to make the transition easier for people. But ever since then, it stayed the standard. Some people have questioned this and made different keyboards and a variety of other key layouts, but it remains the standard not because not enough people have questioned the status quo or decided that it's worth putting in the effort to make a change. So we have millions of people now using devices all day long with a key keyboard layout that was handed to them by a relatively few number of marketers and designers who don't want to lose sales by going against mainstream expectations. But that expectation only exists because that's the standard option that people are used to not because there's a good reason for it anymore. And millions of people have repetitive stress injuries because their keyboard layout is really bad for our fingers and arms. So as I was saying, unmasking is, in part, the process of questioning the standard options and making more conscious choices for yourself. I've only just got my split columnar keyboard. I got one called Voyager by ZSA Technology Labs, by the way. and. I don't want to say too much about it yet because it does take quite a bit of getting used to. Most of the accounts I read online say that it takes at least a month to rebuild muscle memory to get back to your original typing speed, and I've only had it for about a week. But already there are some things that I do like about it. I like the column layout and think I'll be very happy with that. Other aspects I'm not so sure, but I'm going to give it a fair shot. As I'm learning, I'm letting myself use the laptop when I need to, to get something done quickly. This might increase how long it takes me to get to know and to use the new keyboard, but I'm okay with that. It's not all or nothing, and the speed of transition isn't the most important thing for me. I want to not frustrate myself too much in the process, because that way I'll be establishing a more positive relationship with my new keyboard that I hope to use for a very long time. Okay, I want to speak very briefly about how this is not overreacting or making a mountain out of a molehill. Those phrases and other similar accusations are blanket labels that make judgments from an outsider's perspective without taking the time to understand what's really going on inside someone and why they are reacting the way they are. Everything we do is done to meet some sort of a need. So if someone's overreacting or being dramatic, there's a reason why. In my case, I'm trying to problem solve a situation that I've accepted for far too long. If someone's dramatizing, maybe they're being dramatic because they don't feel seen or heard or understood. If someone's making a mountain out of a molehill, maybe there's a fear or anxiety that they're trying to address. If someone's blowing something out of proportion, they may need a fuller understanding of what's going on or of what to expect in a situation or better tools for dealing with whatever's happening. Labeling someone's behavior with those terms is a way to avoid spending the energy to figure out what's really going on underneath by placing blame and fault on the person who needs help. It's incredibly common and not usually done with malicious intent, and I'll admit that I've done it myself. But now that I understand better what's going on, I'm more able to notice it and to avoid this trap of blaming and shaming, and instead try to help. Okay, that's it for part two. There's one more part to this saga of give a mouse an ergonomic grip and it'll want a whole new office setup. So in part three, I'm gonna be mentioning the whole new office setup. Yes, that did happen. And you'll get to see the before and after because I needed somewhere to put this big non-portable monitor and so on. I'll also be discussing the painful internalized belief that I had to unpack for that, which was assuming that I was being selfish when I wasn't. That's in part three. For now, I wish you a near a wonderful day.